ஆனால் <laughs> that could also be the and uh, one more question i had is like uh, we have we have the names of uh, gabriel michael as angels archangels and all no so were these people first in human form passed away and then became an angel god appointed them or is it like from inception only they have been an angel yeah when we look at that um, psalm passage which we started off with there it talks about angels being created as a separate um form of a species of creatures so it's not that sometimes humans become angels and sometimes angels become humans there's no intermingling of the species if you can call them that angels are a separate created species by themselves humans are a separate species by themselves god has got certain plans and uh, status in mind for angels and he has a separate uh, status in mind for humans because humans were created in the image of god uh, you know to to be rulers of this earth angels on the other hand were created in the heavenlies for some other purpose so there's no intermingling of these two species they are two separate categories of uh, species if you can use that term you know so um, so the gabriel and uh, michael and all these other angels uh, when they were created they were created right from the beginning as angels they are not humans who later became angels there's no interaction between the species simply because there's no verse anywhere in the bible which indicates that such a intermingling can happen okay so in fact we will touch upon that a little further now um so we have been looking at different um um different things that are mentioned in scripture regarding angels so that we can have the correct perspective regarding these things so we will move into the next point um yeah which in fact was just brought up now um because there's this teaching that humans at least some humans after dying become angels so um and they base that teaching on a on some verses which are found in the book of acts so let's look at what actually those verses mean um because what the impression that we get from scripture is that angels will always be angels humans will always be humans you cannot just have um, uh, a kind of uh, metamorphosis where angels sometimes become humans and humans sometimes become angels that is not possible they are two distinct species but there's this verses which are misunderstood in the book of acts which has led to this wrong teaching so let's actually look at that for a little bit um acts chapter 12 verses 13 to 16 which basically is talking about you know peter's deliverance um he's arrested by herod Uh, and then um, you know the angel comes and sets him free from the prison so he comes uh, comes out of the prison and he comes to john mark's house where all the believers are gathered in all night prayer you know they're praying basically for him uh, so that's basically the event which is mentioned over here acts chapter 12 verses 13 to 16 and as peter knocked at the door of the gate a girl named roda came to answer when she recognized peter's voice because of her gladness she did not open the gate but ran in and announced that peter stood before the gate but they said to her you are beside yourself yet she kept insisting that it was so so they said it is his angel now peter continued knocking and when they opened the door and saw him they were astonished all right so in this passage uh the verse 15 uh it says it must be his angel so you know the um, 
the background is basically that Herod had very recently killed James, who is the brother of John. So James has been killed. The Jews are very, very happy. And so Herod thinks, OK, this is nice. These people like it whenever I kill a believer. So he arrests Peter. So the church is now gathered in John Mark's house, and they are praying for him so that his life will be spared, so that he will not be killed in the same way that James has, was killed. But they're not very sure that the prayer will be answered or not. And so in the middle of the night, you they hear a knock on the door. And uh, so you basically have uh, Rhoda, the servant, going to the door. And when she hears Peter's voice, she is so happy that their prayers are answered. She comes running back inside and she says, you know what, Peter is alive. Our prayers have been answered. And they say, how can that be in the middle of the night? You know, I mean, how, how, how could he possibly be here? And she continues to insist that it is him. And so then they say, oh, it must be his angel. The word that is used over there is the Greek word, agelos. So it's, it's literally the word for angel which is used over there. So there are two ways in which people try to understand this. One, 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 one set of people, they say, this must be referring to Peter's guardian angel. So, you know, the people thought that Peter must have been killed. And now uh, the guardian angel is coming to inform the believers that uh, Peter is dead. So they must have thought of it in that way. So when they said it must be his angel, maybe they were thinking that it's um, Peter's guardian angel who's knocking on the door. But if you basically look at the passage, it says that Rhoda recognized Peter's voice. So are we saying... Are we coming up with a theory saying that guardian angels will have the same voice as the person whom they are guarding? You know, we're making a lot of assumptions which are not backed up by scripture. So this may not really be uh, what they had in their minds when they said it must be his angel. In Jewish mythology, you know, they had their own set of beliefs and um, not all their beliefs were in line with the Old Testament scriptures. So among their you know, folklore, one of the ideas which they had in their minds back then, the Jewish people, was that when a person dies, now this is not scriptural, the Old Testament does not say this, but the Jewish people, you know, in their mythology, in their belief system, they generally believed that when a person dies, his soul continues to you know be there for three days just in case you know the body comes back to life so their belief among their popular mythology was that when a person dies his soul continues to hang around for three days and at the end of three days when the body begins to decompose then the soul um, goes either to sheol or goes to abraham's bosom you know depending on um, whether the person was a good person or a bad person. So this was their uh, belief system, though, of course, it is not backed up by the Old Testament. So the chances are when they said it must be his angel, they had that in their minds. Because that Jewish mythology, it basically taught that after hanging around for three days, if that person was a good and godly person, he would get changed into an angel and he would go into Abraham's bosom. On the other hand, if he is not a good person, then he would not turn into an angel. He would instead be condemned and sent to Sheol. That was their mythology. So these people, uh, because they, you know they believed that Peter is a good person, they probably thought that his... Um, spirit has come knocking on the door and which is why it has the voice of peter okay so we got to understand that in acts chapter 12 the believers are still at a very young stage in their faith they still have not absorbed the scriptures been taught the scriptures clearly they have not had time to you know really grow in the scriptures so they still have a lot of wrong belief systems in their minds so when they said it must be his angel, they are not declaring something from the Old Testament scriptures. They are, you know, um, resorting to the popular beliefs that were prevailing in their times. So, in this passage, 
it is most definitely not talking about humans becoming angels after death okay that is simply not the uh, doctrine which is being presented in this particular bible passage what does the bible say about what happens to us after we die i mean um, that's very you know in a, in a in a very simple way second corinthians 5:8 uh this is what second corinthians 5:8 says um where paul is talking about himself and he says you know i would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the lord so when once a person leaves his body he immediately goes to be at home with the lord he doesn't hang around over there his soul doesn't keep hanging around the body that is that is uh more the mythology which people believe in the bible plainly says that after a person leaves their body they immediately go to be at home with the lord and then of course in first corinthians 15 verse 35 onwards it talks about how one day we will be transformed but we won't be transformed into angels no we will be transformed into the resurrected body which god will give us that is what we are going to be transformed into okay so let's let's actually look at a few uh, of those verses um first corinthians 15 if we could maybe read out verses 35 to 37 first corinthians 15 35 to 37 but someone will say how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come foolish one you what you sow is not made alive unless it dies and what you sow you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain perhaps wheat or some other grain yeah uh paul uses the imagery of a seed to talk about this whole idea of a resurrected body he says when you put a seed into the ground what comes out doesn't look anything like the seed you know the seed is you know round and small and really tiny but what comes out of the ground is so completely different it's an entire plant or a tree or it can even be one of those huge you know trees which grow uh, uh, very high so a seed and what comes out are so completely different he says it's like that with us when we die our physical body will be buried under the ground but what comes out that resurrected body which we will receive when when the rapture happens that will be so gloriously different you know so he says there's no there's no real resemblance between what we are now and what we are going to be so we will be transformed into something very grand we will i'm sure you know look as grand as the angels so you know we don't have to feel inferior that somehow we you know we don't look as uh, special as the angels when we receive our resurrected bodies we will be as awesome as the angels but we will never become angels you know so uh, uh this wrong uh, belief which the jewish people held you know in the time of jesus about how uh, good people will get transformed into angels and then go into the abraham's bosom that was a wrong teaching a wrong belief that they held in those days on the other hand scripture tells us that we will go to be with the lord i'm assuming that in the in when we go to be with the lord we will just be in spirit form um but we will receive a resurrected body at the time of the rapture um another thing that we need to uh, talk about uh, is you know we've been happily saying demons fallen angels and all of that so maybe we should look at some verses about how they came into being uh so of course we are familiar with these things uh you know but just to go over it once again jude uh, verse 6 so if we could uh look at how fallen angels came into existence jude uh, verse 6 and the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day it says over here that certain angels did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling god assigned to angels certain positions 
God gave them certain authority. They were given certain tasks. But these angels did not keep the positions of authority which they had been given. They abandoned their proper dwelling. Rather than continuing to stay in the posting which, where God had placed them, they wanted something more. They wanted something different. They wanted something greater. They became greedy for power. And, you know, which is what we see about even uh, um, uh, Satan, right? So um, let's look at another scripture, Isaiah 14, uh, verses 12 to 15. Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. How? You are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So here we see one example. I mean, it, it only talks about uh, uh, Lucifer over here. But then there are many other angels also who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. So Lucifer, we know, he was appointed to be the guardian of the, um, the holy mountain. That was his position. That was his proper dwelling. But he chooses to abandon his proper dwelling. He says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. He says, I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly. That was not the proper position or dwelling that was given to him. He was appointed for, for another task. He was supposed to be the guardian of the holy mountain. So he went against the position and authority that was given to him. And in Jude verse 6, we are told that some of these angels who participated in this rebellion against God, they have been chained in um, a place of darkness. So it says over there in Jude chapter 6, uh, Jude verse 6, it says, um, These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So there is there are so there are some angel, uh, fallen angels and demons which are allowed to you know uh, move about freely on the earth, but there are some who have already been bound and placed in a uh, place of darkness for the future judgment. Mm, let's look at some more verses regarding this. Second Peter chapter two verse four, which repeats almost the same thing. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So when the, these angels who have sinned, they were sent to hell, to a, to, a, to a certain portion of hell, where they are being held in chains of darkness. And... Um, the demons make a reference to this in a popular passage which we are familiar with. Luke chapter 8, 30 to 33. Luke 8, 30 to 33. Now, a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. Now, uh, if you were to look at verse 30. And it's... Jesus asked them, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion. Because many demons had entered him. So um, Jesus is addressing the demons which are there in a particular person. And there are many demons inside that poor man. And these demons, they, you know, it says in verse 31, they begged Jesus repeatedly 
not to order them to go into the abyss. So this abyss seems to be the place where certain demons are already being held in chains. And so these angels which are you know, freely moving around on the earth and who have taken position of this man, they beg Jesus and they say, when you cast us out of him, please don't make us go into the abyss. Allow us to, you know, rather than go and live in the pigs. So there is a place called the abyss. Maybe it's one particular portion of hell. And there some angels have already been placed in imprisonment. Some other fallen angels are allowed to roam around at present. But whenever God orders them to go into the abyss, they will have no choice. But they will have to go and, you know, uh, be enslaved over there, be chained over there. So all these uh, fallen angels which are already in the abyss and all the all the fallen angels and demons which are roaming around in the earth today, they all have one final destination which is mentioned in Matthew 25 verse 41. Matthew 25 verse 41. Then he who he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So there's a place of eternal fire, the lake of fire, which has been specifically prepared for the devil and his angels. The sad thing is that even some humans are going to end up over there simply because they have chosen not to place their faith in Jesus who is the only way to the Father. So, you know, the, so actually this lake of fire was not created for humans. It was meant only for the devil and his angels. But of course, all the people who refuse to believe in Jesus, they will also end up over there. So right now, some of the demons are being held in, uh, in, in chains in the abyss. But ultimately, all the, all the demons and the devil will be put into the lake of fire that will be their final destination and it seems to indicate that believers will have a role to play in this event first corinthians chapter 6 verse 3 if someone could read out first corinthians 6 verse 3 do you not know that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? So when these angels are all fallen angels, when all these fallen angels are judged and thrown into the lake of fire, there will be various degrees of punishment which they will experience. Maybe the higher demons which were you know, involved in greater rebellion will be given a harsher punishment in the lake of fire. And it looks like believers will have a part to play in judging these demonic beings. So imagine this high status which has been given to believers, where believers will even participate in the judging of these fallen angels. So believers will have a role to play in what level of punishment would be given to these demonic beings. Um, so we kind of get uh, indication regarding that from... 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Let's move on to another concept uh, regarding this whole uh, you know, uh, subject of angels. Um, angels are known by different names. Uh, you know, um, there is a hierarchic, there's a hierarchical system. Um, so you have demons belonging to different levels of power and authority. Um, and we see an example of that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We also see that repeated in Colossians. Colossians 1.16 also talks about that, where um, the demons are divided into various categories based on the level of power which they possess. Uh, so if we could have someone read out Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickednesses in the heavenly places. I am assuming that I have not covered this point over here. 
I have not talked about this, right? Very difficult to remember. OK, so uh, there are four levels of demons being mentioned over here. The highest ones, you know, it depends on the translation that you're reading. In different English translations, you'll have different wordings used for these four categories. But basically, in the, in the original Greek, these are the four categories. The highest seem to be what are called as the arkas, A-R-C-H-A-S. No, that's basically the word which means ancient ones. Uh, that's basically the Greek word from where you get archives, archaic. No, it's talking about ancient, very, very old uh, things. So the highest ranking demonic powers are probably these ancient ones, these archas. They are the highest level of demons. And then uh, the next Greek word that is used, um, they are the exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. These exousia, they hold delegated authority which the Arkas have given to them. So you, at the topmost level, you have uh, the devil and the Arkas. And the power which they hold, they delegate some of their authority and power to the ones below. So the next line of leadership in the demonic world is the exousia. They hold, um, the word exousia literally means, you know, power, authority. So they hold power which has been delegated to them. And then the third uh, Greek word that is used, um, that is basically Cosmo Kratos. Cosmo basically means world. And that word um, Kratos basically means ruler. So world rulers. So under the exousia, you have a series of world rulers. So you have different world rulers controlling different territories of the earth. They talk about territorial spirits, right? Um, so that's basically where the idea uh, comes from. That different regions of the world are controlled by different demonic powers. So these are the Cosmo Kratos. And then you have the lowest level of demons, which are ju just simply called spiritual forces of evil. Um, these, these are your just average evil spirits, you know, which, which do the work uh, which has been assigned to them by the higher demonic powers. So there is a hierarchical system in the demonic world as well. In the same way, when it comes to God's angels, you know, you have the archangels, which are at a very high level. Um, it talks about, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the, the prince of, of, um, of Persia, that is a demonic uh, prince. So you have all these designations given, you know, when it talks about these um, angelic beings. Another word, common word that is used for angels is uh, the one which is used in Job chapter 1 verse 6. And in fact, in many other places, uh, the what is the term that is used for angels over here? Job chapter 1 verse 6. Job 1 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Yeah, so here uh, the, the angels are referred to as sons of God. That's the term that is used for them. Um, Daniel 4 13, yeah, uses a different term. Daniel 4, verse 13, if someone could read out. I saw in the visions of my head, while on my bed, and there was a watcher, so a holy one coming down. She's reading it. She's reading. Only thing, can we have more volume so that we can hear uh, her reading out? I saw in the visions of my head. At our end, the, the volume is low, so we are not able to hear you read. He'll just increase the volume. You go ahead. Yeah. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one holy coming one. down from holy one coming down from heaven. Yeah. So here uh, the, the word that is used for uh, the angel is the term watcher. So 
uh, and again the same thing is mentioned even in the same passage daniel 4 uh, verse 17 where it says this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones so um, the angels are referred to as holy ones and they are referred to as watchers in this uh, passage this basically is your uh, nebuchadnezzar passage where um, you know nebuchadnezzar has a dream and in his dream he sees an angel coming to him and declaring judgment against him saying that because he has not honored god but because he regards himself as being equal to god or superior to god he will be reduced to the level of an animal so the watcher a holy one comes and gives him this judgment in his uh, dream uh, so these terms which are used uh, are um, uh, sons of god and watchers and holy ones they all refer to angels um why are the angels being called watchers over here uh, this is just basically a normal word uh, which means messenger let's look at isaiah 21 verse 6 to 8 where it talks about a human watcher isaiah 21 6 to 8 for thus says the lord said to me go set a watchman let him declare what he sees and he saw a chariot with a pair of horsemen a chariot of donkeys and a chariot of camels and he listened earnestly with great care so uh, here in this passage it talks about a human watcher so a watcher is basically someone who delivers a message a watcher is someone who is basically like a messenger so you have human watchers the prophets the old testament prophets are referred to as watchers in the sense they listen to what god has to say they wait upon god and watch what he has to say and then they come to the people and they deliver that message so in the same way angels are also watchers in the sense they spend time in the presence of god and whatever message they have received from him they come and they deliver it to people so um when we come to the genesis 6 passage which talks about the sons of god and it talks about uh, the angels who are watching the earth you know the whole thing is kind of taken um, in a very wrong sense so um um there there are this series of apocryphal books called the books of enoch there isn't just one book there are many many books of enoch in the second book of enoch he talks about i mean that person whoever wrote that particular book he gives his own interpretation for genesis chapter 6 where he says that god has appointed a bunch of angels as watchers and their duty is to watch over the people and guard them so while these angels are you know living here on the earth and watching and guarding over the uh, humans they begin to observe that human women are very beautiful and so they decide to take some of these human women as their wives and um, so as a result of the intercourse between these watchers and these human women a race of giants was formed you know that is that is basically what is said in the second book of enoch which is a apocryphal book and then the same story is almost you know the the same story is repeated in in, a, in another apocryphal book called jubilees so even in the book of jubilees it says that these watchers began to lust after the human women who were very beautiful and so when they had intercourse with these human women it led to a race of giant uh, monsters who corrupted the people of the earth so this apocryphal interpretation of genesis 6 is basically what majority of the christians hold on to and it's a little sad because this interpretation doesn't come from the old testament this interpretation is coming from apocryphal books which are not inspired so maybe when we when we look at this interpretation of genesis 6 we should take it with a pinch of salt don't fully accept what is being said over here because these are apocryphal writings 
and it is their interpretation of genesis chapter 6 so maybe we should not just so um, welcomingly so innocently and naively accept the apocryphal interpretation of genesis chapter 6 let's actually look at genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 4 um yeah someone could read out genesis 6 1 to 4 now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose and the Lord said my spirit shall not strive with man forever for he is indeed flesh yet his days shall be 120 years there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. So there are two ways in which people interpret this passage. I will you know, just explain both the beliefs which are there. Uh, it is up to you which, uh, which belief you would like to go with. But I know I'll start off with a popular belief, you know, the pop popular interpretation of this passage, which is basically that the sons of God over here, meaning angels, the fallen angels, they chose to marry human women. And so when they married human women, they were able to give birth to children and those children were born as giants. That is basically the popular belief that is accepted by almost the entire church but this belief is based on two apocryphal writings which were most definitely not inspired by the Holy Spirit so maybe we should be more careful in accepting this explanation because there are many assumptions being made when we present this theory the first assumption that we are making is that angelic beings which are spirit beings who don't actually have a physical body we are making an assumption that spirit beings are designed in such a way that they can actually have intercourse with a human woman so that is an assumption that we are making it nowhere in scripture does it actually say that another assumption that we are making is that these angels actually have the ability if not for intercourse at least to be able to produce human genetic material, you know, and be able to produce babies. Do angels really have that ability to be able to produce human genetic material? Do they have permission from God to be able to produce genetic material whenever, whenever they feel like it? These are all a series of assumptions being made. And there is no verse in the Bible backing up any of this. In the Bible, in fact, we only see one example, uh, you know, of Mary, where the Holy Spirit creates human, uh, a human sperm and places it inside the womb of uh, Mary. You know, because there's no man involved in the birth of Jesus. So God literally must have created the genetic material required and placed it inside Mary's womb so that she is able to produce a fully human Jesus Christ. Now, were angels given this kind of an ability? Did God give them the permission to be able to do that? And uh, if there was actual intercourse, can spirit beings have intercourse with a human? A series of assumptions are being made over here with no backing of any kind from the Old Testament. And the only backing for this theory is from two apocryphal books, which were written you know, during the intertestamental period you know, the, the time period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, when people were doing whatever they wished, living however they wished, and there was no prophet from God speaking at, in, in those days. So maybe we should be a little careful about accepting this theory. There's a second belief, which seems more likely. The second belief is basically this, that, you know, when we, when we read that particular verse, um, what is the verse? Uh, Genesis chapter 6 verse 2. 
yeah if, if you you know if you could just read out that verse once again that genesis the sons chapter of god yeah. saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose the wording over here it basically says that the sons of god that the angels they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose you know so the second theory is that these um, fallen angels they took wives in the same way that they take human beings now you know through demon possession so one way that we could look at this verse is they took these beautiful women in the sense they possessed them the, those beautiful women became demon possessed and you know we are very familiar with the uh, with this whole temple prostitution ritual which which existed in those days so uh, men would go to these temple prostitutes and they would have intercourse with them so the theory is that maybe the fallen angels took beautiful women you know they possessed them they this women became demon possessed and maybe when 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 men would come you know and perform uh, demonic rituals you know those witchcraft rituals and sleep with these women then the the babies which were born out of that kind of a of a of, a, of an intercourse probably were you know deformed and very huge in size because you know they were they were born out of uh, witchcraft rituals so when we look at this theory there is no um, there is no unbiblical assumptions being made in the sense we are not saying that a, a spirit beings can have intercourse with humans nor are we saying that they have the permission to create genetic human genetic material which can actually be you know viable in a human womb we are not making any of those assumptions we are bas basically talking about demon possession we are talking about uh, temple prostitution where men did uh, you know uh, sleep with um, prostitutes who probably were demon possessed and so the offspring which would come out of such uh, such an intercourse would be uh, demonic in nature so maybe this you know uh, children which were born were you know in the form of giants so again this is an, uh, another theory now nobody of no you know really really knows a clear interpretation of this so the reason that we are only talking about this is because it talks about the sons of god angels interacting with humans leading to a race of giants but one thing is sure when the flood comes all these demons which were you know uh, all these giants which were created which were born every single one of them died and was wiped out you know the the word that is used for them in um, in in genesis um, chapter 6 it calls them the nephilim that word nephilim it talks about uh, you know that word and the word nephilim is a hebrew word which basically comes from the hebrew verb to fall nafal nafal means to fall so these uh, giants are called nephilim because they cause people to fall they are very powerful they are very mighty they are able to oppress and uh, cause people to fall in that sense okay the word nephilim talks about very powerful mighty uh, people so all the nephilim were wiped out during the flood not a single one of them survived in the book of numbers you have a, again the term nephilim being mentioned let's look at that numbers chapter 13 verses 32 and 33 numbers 13 32 and 33 Numbers thirteen twenty two, thirty two and thirty three. Thirty two. Numbers thirteen uh, verses thirty two and thirty three. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, "The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature." there we saw the giants the descendants of anak came from the giants 
and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight the nephilim who are being talked about over, over here are most definitely not the nephilim who were there before the flood because in the flood only eight persons were saved the ones who had entered the ark every other living being was wiped out so the nephilim over here are basically the descendants of somebody named anak Anak was a descendant of Noah and his sons. So, Anak is not a descendant of those giants which were there before the flood. So, these giant people who you know who were living in the land of Canaan, they are just the descendants of Anak. Maybe again there was some kind of demon you know position involved. Maybe there were temple rituals which were performed leading to this kind of. Uh, 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 you know, a giant race of people, because nowhere in the Old Testament do we see any of these giants, you know, showing their allegiance to Yahweh. All of them were against Yahweh. So we don't really know how they became giants. Again, were there some kind of temple, uh, you know, witchcraft rituals involved? But one thing is for sure, these Nephilim are not in any way connected to the Nephilim which were there before the flood, because during the flood, all of the Nephilim were wiped out. Okay, so uh, the second belief does not involve too many assumptions where we just simply say that human women were taken by the fallen angels. They were possessed by the fallen angels. And when men had intercourse with these human women, babies were born. And those babies were born as a result of witchcraft. And so, therefore, they probably were giants. Okay, so... Um, this is one way of looking at it. Now, um, if we had a little more time, we could have looked at all the things, the activities that angels do. Um, maybe let's look at one or two verses in the little time that we have. Angels, one of the main activities of the good angels is that they continually praise and glorify God. And this one point that I want to make over here very specifically regarding the way the, the angels worship and glorify God. Job chapter 38 verses 4 to 7. Job 38, 4 to 7. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To that, to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? It says that when God was creating the earth, the angels were so excited. It talks about them as morning stars. If you remember, uh, Lucifer was also a morning star. So over here, it's not talking about stars. It's talking about angels. So the morning stars uh, sang together and the angels shouted for joy. The thing about the worship and praise which angels do, it's not out of a sense of duty. They do it because they're so excited by the things which God does and they're so excited about who he is. You know, when they keep crying out, holy, 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 it's not that they're performing a solemn ritual. They're crying out, holy, holy, because they're excited about who he is. And when they praise and worship the works which he has done, it's because they are excited about the things which he's doing. You know, not like the worship which we sometimes give to God in, on, on Sunday. We stand over there and we do the whole thing like as if it's a responsibility that has to be done. Our worship should be like the worship of these angels. It says that they were singing together and the angels were shouting for joy because they were so excited about what God was doing. That should be the same kind of worship that we should offer. You know, so even though we have no time for all the other activities of the angels, that's, and I thought maybe we could dwell upon this one point because angels set an example of what true worship should be like. Okay, so um, yeah, as we are out of time, we will close. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, if we can close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that we could learn today. Uh, from the scriptures about angels. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have created these very powerful beings to help us, to assist us, to protect us, 
we thank you o oh lord that you care for humans so much that you made us in your own image and you appointed powerful uh, superior beings to serve us how high we are o oh lord in your eyes how deeply we are treasured and loved by you so we pray o oh lord that our main focus will always be you that you will be the center of our worship that we will not focus on angels or get attached to them but rather we will always focus on you and worship you and honor you and as and when angels are required you will send them o lord to help us to serve us uh, to assist us in our ministry we thank you o lord for this in jesus name amen